Good day. Today I am going to talk about power transition theory. Uh, this is an approach to war that uh, really emerged in uh, the 1980s um, in the writings of Ken Organsky and Jacek Kugla on the one hand uh, and Robert Gilpin um, on the other. Uh, I'm going to lay out uh, the assumptions of power transition theory. Uh, I will argue that um, each of these assumptions is extremely dubious. I will also challenge its empirical basis, contending that each of the cases that are offered historically as examples of power transition theory are not. They're, they're something quite different, even the exact opposite of what power transition uh, contends. We have a puzzle, and that is that power transition theory is um, both unscientific, empirically questionable, theoretically crude, yet enormously influential. Uh, it has shaped and continues to shape American understandings of China. Uh, most recently, it's been given a boost by all the publicity that uh, Graham Allison's book, The Thucydides Trap, has received, uh, even though that book <laughs> is even conceptually and empirically more embarrassing than any of its predecessors. So, how does this happen? Why is it so? What are the implications for international relations and uh, international relations theory? So we'll start at the beginning with these versions of power transition uh, theory. Um, Organsky and Kugler and Gilpin uh, start from uh, a similar assumption that there is or generally is a dominant power and very often a rising power that as it becomes more powerful thinks of challenging the dominant power for its leading position in the international system or society. For Organsky and Kugler at a certain point the rising power feels strong enough to flex its muscles and go to war with the dominant power so it can remake the international order to reflect its interests and benefit from it in a way the dominant power it replaced had done. Uh, for Gilpin, it's more likely that the dominant power will go to war and do so uh, because it fears that the rising power could become strong enough to challenge it successfully. It accordingly goes to war, war first in a pre preventive war to keep this from happening. Uh, Gilpin nevertheless uh, also acknowledges the other possibility and also the possibility that uh, there can be some accommodation. So uh, his formulation of it is not nearly as deterministic uh, as that of um, Organsky and Kugler. Uh, since their books, uh, there has been uh, mushrooming literature on power transition. Uh, this continues uh, despite uh, compelling critiques uh, that have been offered, authored by a number of people, in, including me. Let's now excuse me, turn to the assumptions of power transition theory. Uh, the first is that there are dominant and rising powers. Uh, I think we can agree that in many circumstances uh, there is a power that is primus inter pares, more powerful than the rest, as the French were for a long time, and the United States has been since um, 
the end of World War I, uh, there have continually been rising powers in history. Uh, one of the problems the theory encounters is how you determine the power of states. Uh, many attempts to do this uh, rely on so-called objective indicators of economy or military capability. But in the real world we know any of these judgments are subjective and the judgments that count are never those of the analysts but of policymakers themselves. And in the real world uh, when we come to look at cases of rising or dominant powers there is also or often great disagreement within policy making elites as to what's going on. A simple case in point is in the Nixon administration during the negotiations for the SALT-1 arms control treaty uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger uh, was willing to negotiate a treaty that gave the Russians a certain advantage. He was willing to do this because he saw them as a rising power and wanted to lock them into place in an agreement uh, before they became more powerful. Secretary of Defense uh, James Schlesinger saw the U.S. as the rising power and the Soviet Union as rising at a lower rate or even declining because of its command and control, uh, excuse me, its command economy. Uh, he insisted that an agreement should be based on actual equality. So, two intelligent policymakers in the same political system disagreeing completely over who was rising and who was falling. When we look at policymakers on the eve of World War I, as William Bullforth has, we find the same divisions uh, within the major powers. No consensus whatsoever over who was a rising state, who was declining, who would overtake whom and when. For um, power transition theorists, however, these issues are unproblematic. But this is only scratching the surface of the critique. There are much more fundamental issues. And uh, the major one here is the assumption that the dominant power organizes the system in a manner in which it benefits greatly and at the expense of other states. Well, in theory, this might be possible if there was a real hegemon or a regional one. So, for example, the Soviet Union managed to do this in its relations with Eastern European states. And to a great extent, the United States did so too with respect to Latin America. But when we talk about the great powers interacting with one another, this isn't the case. After every one of the great systemic wars, beginning with the Treaty of Westphalia and continuing it uh, through the Treaty of Utrecht and the settlement of the Spanish uh, War of Succession, um, the Congress of Vienna after the Napoleonic Wars, Versailles after World War I and Bretton Woods and related agreements after World War II, uh, we find that the order that is designed is one in, that has emerged by virtue of negotiation. It's not imposed by one dominant power, although a particularly powerful state like the U.S. may take the lead in organizing the order. It has to be sold to other players. They have to see that there are things that are important to them in it. So what emerges, uh, emerges by a virtue of imposition and consensus. And thus, uh, most of the powers who are involved have an incentive to keep the order going and not to challenge it, even when they become more powerful. And here too, let's look at an historical example. Uh, people like Robert Cohane, who wrote After Hegemony, Hegemony, foolishly worried in the 1970s that as Germany and Japan became more powerful, 
they would rebel against the international order organized by Washington. Instead, they would seek to impose arrangements from which they benefited. Uh, he was surprised uh, when this didn't happen. When you think about it, there's nothing to be surprised about. Uh, Germany and Japan did very well from this order. It was an order that uh, did not uh, oppress them, but created benefits for them. It's, I suppose, theoretically possible they could have made some marginal uh, advantage uh, economically or in status by reorganizing or restructuring the order, but to risk war to do so was absolutely out of the question for them. It was something that was never even um, considered. The next point, which is, I think, an equally uh, damning uh, critique of power transition theory, is that um, there's no evidence for it historically. When we look at the pattern uh, in Europe and then in the world of rising powers and how dominant powers respond to them, uh, it's not by war. Uh, the rising powers want to be admitted to the great power club. To do this, you do not throw a rock, so to speak, through the front window of the home of the president of the club. Rather, you seek to uh, ingratiate yourself to them and to demonstrate uh, your uh, qualifications for membership. Traditionally, it's changed now, traditionally, this meant that you needed to show your military strength. It was through slashing and burning that states became recognized as great powers. So, indeed, rising powers went to war, but they did so against smaller states or once great but significantly declining powers. So almost everybody went to war against either Spain or the Ottoman Empire. Huh? Russia became a great power by defeating Sweden, a declining power, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Prussia went after um, Austria. The United States became a great power after defeating Spain in 1898. Uh, the great powers, rather than trying to suppress rising powers, have historically sought to tame them by admitting them into the club, by making them great powers, and socializing them to the conventions of the game of international politics. Uh, this has not always worked, but it's, it's worked more often than not. So the pattern that we see in the real world between dominant or great powers and rising powers is a very, very different one than described by power transition theory. Uh, now, there are indeed transitions, but these transitions come about in the aftermath of wars and because of the wars, rather than being causes of those wars. Huh? So consider, again, the U.S. emerged as a dominant power because of World War I. Uh, the U.S. hardly started uh, World War I. In fact, it came in very late in the game in 1917, three years um, into the war. In a data set uh, that I put together of all wars since 1648, the conventional uh, year uh, used uh, by people for the start of a uh, modern international system, in other words, following the treaties of Westphalia. Uh, my data set included all wars that had a great or a rising